Good morning. On behalf of the ISO, I'd like to welcome you to the Excess Behind the Mirror Production Initiative meeting to discuss the revised draw proposal. My name is Jimmy Bashar with the ISO Stakeholder Affairs Group, and I'm also joined by my colleagues here in the room today, starting to my left. Priyanka Rambudi from Meeting. Heather Kelly, Settlement. Dave Murkoff from Policy. Bill Weaver from Lou. Luis Tantos, Settlement. Chris Devin, Policy. Thanks, folks. As with all of our initiatives, the presentation and all related materials for this webinar can be found on the Stakeholder Processes webpage, located on the drop-down menu under the Stay Informed tab on our website. And then you would notice this specific initiative under the Current Initiatives section. Our agenda for today's meeting, as you can see, is to continue discussing how we've shaped our proposal to address stakeholder input. Specifically, the application of losses is the biggest change we've made since the last iteration, as well as others that we'll discuss with you today. And we, of course, appreciate all of the input from you to date. And most, and hopefully all of you know by now, this is a simple display of our stakeholder process, which, as you can see, utilizes the input obtained by stakeholders between each proposal iteration, after which we will carry the proposal forth to our board for consideration for approval. And moving on to the current timeline, as you can see, after today, we are asking for comments to the discussion and proposal to be submitted by November 27th. We do understand that this is coming off of a holiday, so we are, of course, willing to be flexible with this date as it approaches if folks prefer more time to craft their comments. In addition, calls and webinars are recorded for stakeholder convenience, allowing those who are unable to attend to listen to the recordings after the meetings. The recordings will be publicly available on the ISO webpage for a limited time following the meetings. Of course, the recordings and any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without the ISO permission. And if you have a question, please raise your hand by pressing pound two on the telephone keypad. And for everyone, of course, please state the name and the company that you represent. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Gabe to start the presentation. Okay, um, thanks again, Jimmy, uh, for that introduction. I appreciate it. And, and again, we'd like to, here at the ISO, we'd like to thank everyone for participating in this stakeholder process. We've certainly got a lot of good feedback on this initiative to date, and it's been very helpful in, uh, in crafting and informing the direction that this policy is taking. So to start with on slide eight, uh, we'll just go through and, and I will say, too, um, that a lot of this presentation is reused materials from the initial straw proposal. A lot of our core principles about how we are um, approaching this question have not changed from the straw proposal. As, as Jimmy said, we, we have had some new thoughts on losses, and we've changed a couple of other ideas, and we've included some clarifications. But the primary direction of the policy has not changed significantly from the straw proposal. So you will see a lot of overlap in this slide deck compared to what we presented in the initial slide deck for uh, our straw proposal. So just to start with a little bit of background and context, um, the excess behind the meter production occurs when behind the meter generation exceeds consumer's host load. This is the initial concept that we put forward for this. Uh, this is becoming a greater and greater issue here in California as um, we see growth in non-utility scale solar. In fact, I think we included this in the paper, there's about 6,000 or there's more than 6,000 megawatts of non-utility scale solar in place in California with about 2,500 megawatts um, that's been developed since 2016. Uh, as this growth continues, accounting for excess behind the meter production will become more and more important uh, as something uh, that the ISO does to make sure that we are fully informed on about what's going on in the system. Excess behind the meter production is not applicable to energy that's currently generated and scheduled into the ISO, so this doesn't apply to current resource IDs. And then excess behind the meter production also uh, does not apply to certain entities with pre-existing load calculation determined at a city gate, and we've talked a little bit about that in prior presentations as well. So this example on slide number nine is the same example that we used the last time we were talking about excess behind the meter production. It's a very simple diagram with just a two household model and one generator. Essentially, on in the left-hand side of the example, we walk through a situation where there's no rooftop solar or there's no uh, solar generation that's occurring. 
And in this example, we've got two households, household one and household two. Household one consumes one kilowatt hour of energy. Household two consumes five kilowatt hours of energy. That consumption is generated from the distribution level grid. So six kilowatt hours of, of generation come from traditional generators. On the right-hand side of this diagram, we show the same thing, but in a situation where there is rooftop production coming from household one. So in this half of the diagram or example, we have a household number one with a solar panel on top of the household. That solar panel is producing two kilowatt hours of energy. The household continues internally to consume one kilowatt hour of energy. So the meter at the household level sees one kilowatt hour of energy moving from the household um, back onto uh, the lines outside of the house. And the same situation exists here where household two continues to consume five kilowatt hours of energy, but because there's an additional one kilowatt hour of energy coming from uh, household number one, it's only, uh, only four kilowatt hours are, of energy are needed from the traditional generator. So we've got four kilowatts coming from the traditional generator and one kilowatt hour coming from household one, making up the total consumption of five kilowatt hours at household two. So this example is very simple, but it's also nice because it conveys three potential problems. Uh, the first problem is that if gross load is reported to the ISO, it could be potentially reported by either netting excess behind the meter production or without netting excess behind the meter production. So when a uh, scheduling coordinator is scheduling gross load, it may net off excess behind the meter production or not net off excess behind the meter production, and that could create some inconsistencies in how the gross load figures are reported to the ISO. That feeds into issue number two that's demonstrated. If there are two different figures reported for gross load, that could have settlement implications. So there could be two areas that are electrically identical, but they're reporting different gross load numbers, and then allocation for charges such as the transmission access charge or TAC may be allocated more heavily towards the, um, those areas that are reporting uh, gross load without netting anything off of it. And then the third problem is that when only gross load is reported, the ISO really doesn't have any insight into how much excess behind the meter production there is. Um, that excess behind the meter production may be incorporated in gross load if, if those numbers are knitted together when they're reported to the ISO, or they may be captured in unaccounted for energy or UFE, um, and we don't really have insight into which, which place that these, that these show up in. So on slide number 11, what we've done is we've outlined three goals or three primary goals for this initiative to sort of address these three questions. Um, first is ensure consistent reporting of gross load by clarifying the definition of the tariff. And uh, th those are the same clarifications for the most part that we talked about in the initial straw proposal. Second, uh, we're going to create a clear tariff definition for excess behind the meter production. And then third, we're going to specify how excess behind the meter production will be reported to the ISO and then eventually uh, settled. And we've got some additional details that we'll talk through here, um, including, as, as Jimmy mentioned in our, um, in our initial slide, just, just talk a little bit about the losses and how those are handled. So, Jimmy, do we have any questions on the phone right now? Uh, thanks, good. Now that I'm seeing, uh, I'm just seeing something gnarly on your end. Okay, we'll continue. Um, if we do have any questions, we can take them as we, as we go along. So uh, we've constructed some slides here just to sort of talk about each of these three goals. Um, the first goal is to clarify the definition of gross load to ensure consistent reporting. And the major clarification that we've made here is that gross load should be reported to the ISO um, without netting gross load, uh, without netting excess behind the meter production from those values. So the gross load values that are reported to the ISO really should be the summation of channel one energy or the summation of the consumption channels of, of uh, the households that are, um, that are consuming energy. And we, in the example that we had, um, it would, on the right-hand side of that example, that would be the five kilowatt hours of consumption from household two, and, and then the excess behind the meter production would be the one kilowatt hours 
um, that's being pushed uh, from household number one. So that's how we're envisioning this. We've also made a few other uh, clarifications that are listed down here at the bottom of the slide, and these are just really clean, cleaning up the definition of gross load so it's more, um, so, so, so it's uh, uh, cleaner. Thinking about goal number two, create a clear tariff definition for excess behind the meter production. Um, we have created that definition. The definition is energy from an end-use customer in excess of its on-site demand. Um, this definition is intended to represent uh, that excess behind the meter production figures um, will be reported to the ISO. So this, this means that not only will scheduling coordinators report load to the ISO, but they'll also report figures for excess behind the meter production. Um, this will also specify, and, and we've, we've mentioned this already, but losses will not be applied when reporting excess behind the meter values to the ISO. Um, so again, as I mentioned, uh, the gross load values will, will correspond roughly to the summation of the channel one energy or the consumption channel, and the excess behind the meter production will uh, relate to the summation of the channel four energy or the energy that's being pushed back onto the grid from households that have excess behind the meter production. So goal number three, and we're on slide 14 here for those of you following along, uh, we'll just, and we just sort of outlined some of the things that we're doing um, to specify how excess behind the meter production is reported and how the settlements process is working here at the ISO. So excess behind the meter production um, will be reported on the same load resource ID as load, um, but it will be distinguished by measurement type. So one resource ID might have a channel one consumption and it might have a channel four excess behind the meter production or energy that's going back onto um, the lines from a household. Um, these prices, so channel one energy and, and channel four energy, will be subject to the prices that are at the location that they're reported at. So for load, these are the DLAP or the CLAP levels. The determination for UFE will be updated to account for excess behind the meter production. We've included the formula for uh, unaccounted for energy or UFE in the proposal paper, um, and, and this is specified, but we do have a new term in there for excess behind the meter production, um, so that will be uh, captured by UFE. And then finally, um, gross load values uh, will be used for allocation uh, of a number of charge codes, and we've outlined this in Appendix A. This is similar to the list, um, but it's been updated uh, that we included in the appendix of the initial straw proposal. And we did this for a number of reasons, but we did uh, receive a fair amount of stakeholder feedback on the initial list of charge codes that we included in, in appendix A for the straw proposal, so our initial list that was going to be allocated by gross load. Um, and again, th these are allocated based on gross load rather than demand. The feedback stated that the approach that we were taking initially may not have been the best one. So we thought about this internally and we got additional input from some of the stakeholders. Um, and we are now thinking about a new approach to how we are addressing these charge codes. This Appendix A charge codes list, uh, or I'm sorry, Appendix A lists out the charge codes that are related to reliability currently rather than energy use. And these charge codes that are related to reliability are currently listed in our Appendix A for the revised straw proposal. Um, and there are a list of charge codes that we propose should be allocated based on gross load. And on slide 15, we've just got those, those charge codes listed out. Um, so going forward, these are the charge codes that we envision uh, will be allocated by gross load, um, whereas uh, some of the other ones that we included last time, and some of, again, some of those ones that are more related to energy uh, consumption will be allocated based on demand instead of gross load. Uh, any questions so far, Jimmy? Not seeing anything on my end, Gabe. I'll let you see something when you're an operator. We do have a question that just came about. Sure, go ahead. The line is now unmuted. Hi, this is Bonnie Blair. Um, I represent the Six Cities Group. Could you um, maybe give uh, the reasoning behind including emissions cost recovery in the charge code list? Because that uh, just seems to me intuitively to relate more to energy use than reliability. Um, 
I would have to get back to you on that one. Um, a written, I can get back to you on a written answer on that through email if that's fine. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, all the others the, seem to fit the, the concept that it was uh, reliability related, but except the emissions cost recovery. So, yeah. Right. I would have to assume right now that, um, sorry, I have to assume right now that um, the allocation for, for emissions cost is based on um, reliability, so that's probably why it's included. But again, I'd, I'll get back to you and have a written answer to you. Thanks, Bonnie. And we are still working through um, this list of charge codes. So if, if you and we appreciate the, the feedback on this, um, and we're certainly still still thinking hard about what should be included in this list and what shouldn't be. We want to make sure we get this right through this initiative. Um, so we, we appreciate that, and we will think seriously about it. Is this okay. Chris, I, I think that, that that code is not really used anymore. That was something that was um, a historical piece of the, of the um, settlement uh, uh, system um, that we used a long time ago, I think, before um, we started having um, the emission costs in the bids. Um, so I, I don't think that that's an active one anymore, but that was one of the things that James Lynn, who, who couldn't make it today, um, had mentioned to me. Uh, so I, I think that that one's not too much of a concern there. We just had to include it because of the kind of historical nature. Um, but, but I think we need a little bit more background on that from, from James and others and take that offline. Okay, thanks, guys. Operator. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate it. Operator, any other questions in the queue? We do not have any other questions. Okay, great. So we'll move on to uh, losses, and I will admit that this is probably the most complex topic that we'll, we'll cover today, so we'll see if we can get through this, and then um, after the slides on losses, I'll take any questions on those. Um, <clears throat> so starting off on slide 16 here, we are envisioning that losses will not be applied to excess line the meter production for reporting purposes when reporting these numbers to the ISO. Currently, and this is just a little bit of background on losses and DCFs or distribution compensation factors, but currently distribution loss factors may be applied to load figures when grossing up the load. And the primary objective of the distribution loss factor is to true up the quantity of energy that's coming from the transmission distribution interface to sort of the summation of energy that's being accounted for at retail meters that are being served from that transmission dis distribution interface because there can be a difference there, um, particularly uh, if, if there's, for instance, in a, a dense amount of houses in one particular area, uh, the amount of energy coming from the transmission distribution interface can be significantly different sometimes from uh, the summation of, of energy that's consumed at retail meters. Similarly, DCFs or distribution compensation factors may also be applied to generation. So DCFs are similar um, in, the, in that they are used to match the amount of energy that's actually produced at one particular resource um, to the amount of energy that's actually injected at some point onto the transmission grid. Um, so, for example, if a particular resource has a particularly long transmission line from that resource to the point where it's injecting into the grid, again, there could be a difference between the meter amount of energy that's actually coming from the resource and the metering amount that's coming into the grid, um, and that distribution compensation factor is meant to make up the difference between those two metered amounts. So, in slide 17, um, we state that excess behind the meter production will receive credit for offsetting losses. So we're also acknowledging that because there is excess behind the meter production, it could actually reduce the amount of losses um, that, that, are, that are incurred from transmission, the transmission distribution interface to the retail level grids. Um, excess behind the meter production, and then the other thing that we're thinking about here is the actual excess behind the meter production. And generally, that energy is traveling short distances. It's likely not going to reach the bulk distribution system, so it's likely not going to be stepped up. Um, and, then, and then it's also, because of that, its, it's losses are going to be or are likely to be relatively small. 
At this time, it doesn't seem appropriate to apply losses to this energy when reporting them to the ISO. However, and as I mentioned, um, excess binding meter production may actually reduce the overall losses from the transmission distribution interface um, to the retail meters, and this re reduction losses should be captured when scheduling coordinators are reporting those, those gross load values um, to the ISO. So to illustrate this, um, we've, we've put together a very simple example similar to the one that we've already walked through. Um, this example assumes that losses are 10% from the TD interface to the households. Um, and again, very simple two household model here. Um, so we're not trying to do anything too complex. Um, and in the example here, we've also got a left-hand side where we're not considering rooftop solar and then a right-hand side where we are considering rooftop solar. So on the left-hand side, uh, we've got the same situation where there is no um, generation from any rooftop panels. We've got household one that's consuming one kilowatt hour of energy and household two that's consuming five kilowatt hours of energy. So the total consumption from both households is six kilowatt hours. However, because there's 10% losses in between uh, the retail meters and the TD interface, the actual amount of energy that we're reading that's coming from the TD interface is 6.6 .6 kilowatt hours or an additional 10% on top of the six kilowatt hours consumed. So on the right-hand side, we've got the, a similar example, but in this example, we show a uh, rooftop panel, again, generating two kilowatt hours of energy. So we've got this rooftop panel generating, and then at the same time, that household number one is still consuming internally one kilowatt hours of energy. So the meter that we see from household number one is showing uh, one kilowatt hour of excess binding meter production or channel four um, uh, production energy. So one kilowatt hour is being pushed back onto the lines from household one. Household two, similarly, is still consuming five kilowatt hours, um, and on net, Household one and household two are only consuming four kilowatt hours. So the amount that's needed uh, to make up that consumption at the TD interface is uh, the four kilowatt hours plus the additional 10% of losses or 4.4 kilowatt hours. So the next slide, this is slide 19, we basically break all this information out into a table. So just like before, we've got a, a, a gross load figure, or in this case, it's a raw gross load figure. Um, so this hasn't been grossed up uh, for reporting to the ISO, but that's on line I, and that's the five kilowatt hours of consumption from household two. Similarly, we've got row J, which illustrates excess behind the meter production, which is one kilowatt hours, which is the energy coming from household one um, and being pushed back out onto the lines. We've got a distribution loss factor of 0.1. And then uh, losses from gross load are just simply applying the 10% loss factor times gross load. And then the losses avoided are simply applying that, again, 10% um, loss factor times the excess behind the meter production. So the gross load here with the gross up um, or the gross load that could be reported to the ISO would be the total amount of gross load or the raw amount of gross load, the summation of channel one energy plus the losses that are attributable to the gross load, minus the losses avoided from excess behind the meter production, or uh, the five kilowatt hours of energy plus the, five, the 0.5 kilowatt hours um, from, from the losses from gross load, and then minus the 0.1 kilowatt hours from um, the losses avoided, or a total of uh, 5.4 kilowatt hours. In the paper, uh, as well as here on the slide, we've also included uh, just a formula that could represent the, the uh, or, or a potential formula that could be used for grossing up load. Um, and this formula would be uh, just, just the raw gross load values times one plus the distribution loss factor minus the excess line the meter production times the distribution loss factor. And again, um, that raw gross load figure would be the summation of channel one energy and the excess binding meter production would be the summation of channel four energy. Um, Jimmy, uh, I know we covered a lot there. Any questions on your end or operator from your end? Yeah, thanks, Gabe. I'm still not seeing anything on my end operator unless you're seeing something. We do not have any questions at this time. Okay. So this is Chris, so I just want to jump in here and just add a little bit of detail on these losses, um, uh, the, the slides about losses and then the proposal. So I think, you know, it's really important that, that everyone knows, you know, we got a lot of feedback from stakeholders about 
the need to address losses somehow due to this change in our settlement um, process. And so what Gabe's just laid out for you guys is um, our response to that sort of feedback. And we took a, a long time to, to you know, think hard about how we should do this the right way um, and talk with a lot of folks internally and, and externally as well. And ultimately what we determined was we really don't think it's appropriate to apply losses to that actual excess behind the meter production value that's going to be reported to the ISO because there really isn't any losses since that metering point is right at the house. So we know exactly how much is getting produced for that. Um, so, you know, similarly to what Dave talked about with the distribution and contribution factors um, and, and grossing up the, the, the production from generators um, that have long tie lines and those sort of things, um, we don't think that that applies to this type of excess behind the meter production. But the way that we want to address the concerns that the stakeholder has um, expressed so far to this point is to actually give them credit for reducing the amount of losses that the distribution loss factor would actually um, apply to the gross load. So that's really the intent here behind this. Um, so since we didn't get any questions, I just wanted to try to provide a bit more detail and, and, and explanation about how we got to this point and what the real intent is there. Um, thanks, Gabe. Well, I appreciate that. That's good clarification, and, and you're right, Chris. This was certainly informed by feedback that we got from stakeholders, so that's worth, worth mentioning. Um, so finally, on slide 20, I, I do have just a few other items that I wanted to mention, and again, this is also uh, directly addressing feedback that we got from stakeholders. Um, uh, the first was uh, that, that the ISO has committed to publish an aggregation of the excess behind the meter production data in a monthly performance report that will be posted on the website every other month. Um, so we are planning to make at least at least an aggregated version of this data available. I know that was another concern for stakeholders, so we wanted to address that. Um, we've also come up with, we internally we've done an estimation of, of how much uh, load the excess behind the meter production applies to, and roughly 13% um, of the total ISO will be excluded from this charge. And again, at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that this proposal would not apply to certain uh, entities that have pre-existing metering arrangements with the ISO. These include some of the smaller POUs and some of the MSSs. Um, these entities generally have uh, load figures that are calculated at city gate metering points from various inputs, such as you know, imports and exports um, and, uh, and internal generation. These entities do not have requirements to install AMI, which are those automated metering infrastructure smart meters or other enhanced metering systems, which could capture that excess behind the meter production. So I feel like because of these pre-existing arrangements and, and because of the fact that it would be costly to um, mandate that these areas have to uh, start start include, uh, providing some sort of smart metering. Uh, we, we don't feel like it's practical at this time to uh, require changes from, from everyone in the ISO. Um, and that's where we are with that bullet point. And then the uh, third bullet point is allocation of charge codes based on demand. Um, so th this is, the demand is load net of excess line meter production will be capped at zero megawatts. Um, so this cap will apply when excess behind the meter production exceeds load. So you can conceive of uh, demand being negative or, or a situation where for, for some areas excess behind the meter production could actually exceed load. Uh, when this happens, uh, charge codes won't be allocated based on that ratio. They'll, they'll rather be allocated based on um, um, zero megawatts of demand instead. And this is how settlements handle some other values. Um, of course, we don't envision this happening particularly soon, but as solar continues to grow, um, this could be something that, that needs to be addressed in the future, so we just want to sort of get out in front of that potential issue right now. Uh, any other questions? It looks like we have a question in the queue. Sure. Operator, please open the lines. Hi, Gabe. This is Callie Wells for WPTF. Um, first of all, thank you guys very much for committing to publishing the data. We really appreciate that. Um, I'm just curious, because ideally the data would be by DLAP um, for each hour, so I'm curious what you guys' current thinking is in terms of what level of aggregation you envision these reports. Um, sure. Uh, I don't know that we have the details for that right now. Um, we'll, we can follow up offline, though, Callie, if you'd like. Okay. 
Yeah, I appreciate it. I think um, hourly by DLAP would be the most informative. Um, so, yeah, let's follow, off, follow up offline. Okay. Thank you for the question. Yeah. And we do so. have another question. Caller, please go ahead. The line is now unmuted. Uh, hi, this is Bonnie Blair again, um, representing six cities. I have a, a question about the 13%. Um, so when you talk about the 13%, that, that represents the total load of the entities that would not be reporting the excess behind the meter production separately. Do I have that right? I'm, it's, you're not saying that you're going to be, that the unreported excess behind the meter production would be as large as 13% of your total load, are you? No, we're, we're saying um, the former. So the, the, the summation of the load for the entities that, would, that this would not be applicable to would be 13% of the total load of the ISO. Okay, and then the excess behind the meter production that would be attributable to those entities would be some way smaller fraction, I assume. And yeah, and we envision that being a very small number. Along the lines of in the most extreme shoulder months where there's very high levels of, of uh, solar production, it would only be 1 to 3 percent is what we're seeing right now. So. One to three percent of that thirteen percent. So it's a very, very small amount. Right. So, and I'll just add. Uh, so, for a total year, you know, a load surfing entity would probably be one below one percent. That's right. Yes. Good. Yeah. Th thanks, Bill. That, that 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 example I gave was only for like the most extreme periods when we have the most solar and excess by the meter production happening. So, on average during the year, there's going to be many periods where there's none. So it, it should be like what Bill said, less than even one percent. Oh, okay, that, that's, that's helpful. Thanks very much. And we do have another question. Caller, please go ahead. The line is now unmuted. Hey, this is uh, Stephen from the Public Advocates Office, and we appreciate we – we raised maybe along with other stakeholders this issue, and we appreciate you responding. I think it's still something that we will kind of um, dig, uh, dig into and consider, given that uh, – there could be entities with pretty significant behind the meter resources and that given the changes that are coming with attack enhancements to demand that that might also change given the time that solar peaks and so that's just something that us and a couple other stakeholders were uh, concerned about and also I just had an unrelated quick question of, as to whether there will be a comment template for, for this or whether it's going to be just folks submitting more generally. Yeah, we'll provide a comment template similar to the template that we had for the straw proposal. Okay. And I guess just to information of the changes that are – go ahead, sorry. I was just going to respond to your other points about the TAC and the uh, oh, exemption for the current pre-existing arrangements for some of these entities. So, you know, at, at this point our position is that uh, on the TAC piece as well is that we wouldn't be changing um, – the, that issue of where the, the transmission access charge is, is actually um, uh, uh, billed at for the point of measurement for entities that have these arrangements already. Um, so, you know, and that was laid out in our transmission access charge structure enhancements proposal as well. Um, so there wouldn't be a change to that. And for this one, the, this is a similar, uh, we're trying to maintain consistency along that line with, with this. Uh, proposal for that exemption for those research, for those um, particular uh, entities as well, and really the, the driver behind this is the fact that those entities don't have the metering infrastructure in, involved there, and it's not really under the, the purview of the ISO to um, you know be requesting that from those entities. Basically, it's up to their you know city. Um, municipal uh, boards and, and government agencies that, that um, have authority to that to do that sort of thing. So that's really why we we think that such a small issue at this point. We don't believe that it warrants uh, pushing out uh, a, a proposal that would um, require those kind of entities to, to change their metering 
infrastructure that can be very costly. And um, that's okay. something that they have expressed in their, in their kind of comments and concerns on that sort of thing. So just some background about where we are on it, you know, currently. But happy to hear your feedback on, on that sort of thing. Yeah, and I guess I, what we would bring up is that there may be other ways to protect against netting that don't require a large infrastructure investment. And that's something that we'll bring up in comments that you don't have, we don't have to dive into here. But that's a thought. Sure. Thanks, operator. Are there any more questions? We do not have any other questions at this moment. All right. Thanks, Gabe, and thanks, folks, for joining us today. As mentioned, we will be posting a recording for this session uh, when it becomes available, typically within two or three business days. And, of course, uh, with that, have a great rest of your morning. Uh, once more, we are requesting comments by the 27th. And, uh, again, we'll be flexible that day coming off the holidays. So thanks, folks, and please have a great rest of your morning.